absolutely me too like i'm i started to get those those thoughts as well of that by the time like age was creeping up and not that it honestly doesn't matter but i'd be lying if i if i said that it, i wasn't thinking about that and like i was getting to like i got to I think 29 and i was like oh i always wanted to be a concept i can't if i get over 30 i'm never going to be a concept artist like i just had that age for some reason in my head and i thought i'm too old now like i can't just change careers have you ever tried giving up on your art or have you actually given up already because you feel time has run out and there's no point in pursuing your dream. This is something we discuss extensively in today's episode with our guest, the talented Nick Stath, who's a concept artist, designer and architect. And Nick, who's in the early throes of his career, has been working on some fascinating projects of late with the freedom and joy that all artists strive for. But it wasn't always this way. And very recently, Nick even turned his back on art. So, let's find out what happened and to draw some wonderfully honest and inspiring insights and experiences from Nick in the process. And also, watch out for some thoughts on pyramids, corridors, and much more. Let's go. Cool. So yeah, let, let's get going, man. Um, yeah. Everyone, welcome back to the Learn Squared podcast. And I'm delighted to welcome on today's guest, Nick Stath. Hey, Nick. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for jumping on. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess the best place to begin is like how we normally do is just a lovely intro and origin story to our guest. And I'll hand that over to you. Yeah, so I'm a concept artist and designer. Um, I have quite an extensive background in architecture. So back in 2014, I got my architecture degree. In 2016, I got my first taste um, of the concept industry. Uh, but during that period, I still worked uh, in architectural practice for something about uh, six or seven years in total. And it wasn't until 2020 till now that I've been full-time freelancing in the entertainment industry. Ah, so a couple of careers and then a short, short kind of short amount of time. Yes. I mean, it's like what eight years or so since, um, I guess, the architecture journey. Did it begin then, or did it kind of wrap up then? I mean, how long was the uh, the training for that you did? Yeah, so it was actually so the architecture degree, the bachelor and master's degree, was five years. So gee, that was from when I, as soon as I finished high school, um, went straight into uni mm -hmm. for five years. Um, yeah, got blasted with architectural knowledge and history and went down that path, um, became super passionate about architecture, which I still am to this day. Um, but yeah, after that transitioned into architectural practice, um, got a lot of experience working for some really good practices, being on site, seeing how buildings actually went up, which was amazing to be a part of. Um, but yeah, during, during my time, uh, in architecture school, I would constantly find myself kind of referencing architecture in film. And there was kind of like a little passion, I think, there on the side that was building. Um, and yeah, that kind of gave me a little bit of a taste uh, for something, I guess, in the future. Um, and it wasn't until I got an email yeah, in 2016 from a VFX studio here in Sydney that um, kind of opened me up to that world uh, of um, the entertainment industry. Ah, so that's interesting because um, I guess usually you kind of hear like in this situation where you maybe specialize in one thing and then like the architecture is like an industry and a, and a whole universe all into itself, right? Like, you know, people yes. just spend their whole careers in that particular space and sometimes people or often people don't switch. And if they do, it's either because of a specific reason, maybe as a departure, but obviously in your case, it clearly wasn't because like you mentioned, architecture is something that you're passionate about and you can see it in your work as well which i'd love to get into more uh further down yeah um of so like how um like what why was it specifically movies that kind of inspired you and i guess with architecture it's just broad range of kind of like avenues and topics yeah. you can you can go in yeah that's a good a good one to discuss so i think if i'm being completely honest like architecture in practice started to become quite mundane for me 
I think in, in my time at RMIT University studying architecture, it's a really good university for pushing us to be designers and think bold and think of big visions. And that's the stuff that really excited me. And that's why I was saying that I got inspired by films a lot because you see all of these big visions and these amazing architectural spaces and they inspire you. Um, and look, I don't, I don't want to like bad mouth the architectural practice, but I think early on in practice, it was exciting because there was new things and you're being on site and you're seeing buildings go up. But um, as kind of time went on, as I mentioned, it started to become a bit more mundane. So everything started to become a bit more repetitive. Um, in certain places, you can not really be allowed to to have your thought on on the design. You kind of sometimes end up being, as what I call it, a bit of a, a CAD monkey. So just do do the drawings, <laughs> don't have an opinion on the design. And I felt like, yeah. That was that was hurting my creativity a little bit and that's what started to lead me i guess down the path of of pursuing something else um in terms of like we mentioned about being a cad monkey that, that's an interesting way to put it um <laughs> and I, I can kind of well i can relate to it like my background and my, my studies were involved in transport design and yep. although i didn't go into that after uni for different reasons but I just didn't go into it towards the end of my course um the sentiments and the feelings that I had were kind of similar to yourself and yep. a lot of the way things were being projected to us and seems where the opportunities were were less about hey you're going to create and design and conceptualize all these awesome vehicles it was more a case of like there's loads of cool CAD jobs um yep. some of them were decently paid um but it was more a case of like you're going to model something that someone else designed which is fine but at the same yeah. time it's not i guess what we kind of signed up for um and then equally um similar to yourself there was always and has been this passion in films and entertainment design in general which always kind of fueled the ideas and even then it was always kind of like because like with design, especially with things like architecture, I don't know if it was similar for yourself, but there's all that element of futurism and what if, and this yes. is how I would do things. Um, and I guess same with architecture and all these kind of industries where things have to be built, budget, yep. time frames, all that kind of stuff. All those ideas get whittled down into something that's kind of <laughs> manageable for different reasons and has to be kind of made. Um, but nevertheless, there must be some kind of... Um, maybe not joy, but some kind of like, I guess, really cool lessons and insights and learnings you can get from that where they're like, you know, are kind of these, where creative kind of, creativity is kind of restricted, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I still do take that. Um, I think that's helped mold me in a certain way, even in the entertainment industry. Like I actually do prefer to have restraints and constrictions. I like to kind of respond to a brief. I like to be told, look, we can't do this. Like we're restricted to a certain ceiling height or, or the story is restrictive. We can't have big spaces. Like I do like to respond to those things. Like I think, um, again, architecture was great because it teaches you to be a problem solver. And that's exactly what mm. we're also doing in the entertainment industry. Um, in architecture as well, like I think the great thing about working in practice from a young age as well is it taught me very quickly how to be a professional. Like I think there's there's some really, I guess, boring things that you think you don't need to worry about, but are really important. Even just simple things like how to file a project, how to stay mm -hmm. organized, how to, how to deal with clients, how to write an email. Like I actually um, have testament to a lot of those those lessons um, to now that I apply to to just working as a freelancer. Like if I didn't have those things, I think I would be a little bit lost. Interesting. Um, and like I guess let's say because you had that experience now versus your experience working in entertainment design, do you think you would have gained those same skills the same way, or do you think they'd be actually better or maybe worse? Um, I think it depends on the person. Like, I think I could have gotten there in the end, but it might've just <laughs> taken longer. I think cause you're just thrown into the deep end and you're around people that have been already in the office for five to 10 years and they just teach you immediately, like what you got to do. Like mm. they'll, they'll introduce you to a project of how to, 
how to be organized and how they need things filed. Like it has to be like a, a smooth running machine. So you learn very quickly within your first week. Whereas I think if you we were just doing this on your own, you would learn, but it would just take a much longer time, mm. I think. And in terms of like architecture initially, wh- why did you choose to study that in the first place? Of you mentioned there's a passion there. And yep. was there something that kind of developed in you early on where like this is a passion or was it kind of like a strategic choice um, where, okay, this seems like a career that's going to be successful and seems like one that I want to, you know, like enter into and dedicate my life to. Yeah. So it's kind of like a bit of a cliche story, but like I, I drew as a kid a lot. Me and my sister would draw. My mum was a really good, which still is a really good drawer, not a professional artist or anything like that. But she used to get us to draw when we were like probably like four or five years old. Cool. And I continued to draw growing up, like whether it was Pokemon or Dragon Ball Z, like I was I was <laughs> always drawing those those things or characters um, when I was when I was a child and even up until high school. Um, and then, yeah, I guess when it came to that point where they're like, you have to pick a career, everybody's a bit in shock. I think when you're like 17, you don't really know what you want to do. Um, and I kind of just wanted to try and find out like, what's a job that I can draw in and naively thinking that architecture was that Mm -hmm. I decided to follow that path. And I think once I got into uni and just thrown into architecture, um, I think you just start to fall in love with it when you just get all of that history and culture thrown at you mm. and they get you to draw and you, you start to, I think, just develop a passion and you start to develop an appreciation for the subject. And I think because you're just there at uni for so long, um, yeah, it just becomes a part of you really. Like the the drawing and the architecture just kind of combined into into one thing. Well said. Um, and that's, that's so true as well because – you kind of have this, like, it's always a thing, like, where I'll try that. It's like, like an item on a menu to a restaurant you've never been to. Like, you just look at the words and think, okay, that sounds like it's going to taste good. Let's try it. And then either <laughs> it's going to be like, what you thought, not what you thought, or something even so much better and opens a whole new world to this whole new thing. Um, what, yeah, kind exactly. of thi- what kind of things did you draw, like, growing up? Like, was it just, like, obviously you mentioned Pokemon and all those kind of things as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. told, totally did the same thing. But like, was it just the joy of drawing or did you set yourself like mini targets and like, hey, I want to improve on this. I want to level up on that. Or was it just kind of like gaming where you just thought I'm just having fun? Yeah, it's honestly, it was just having fun. It was, it's really nice thinking back to it because it was just, it was just human intuition. Like I kind of think like, you know, drawing, storytelling, you know, writing music, like they're all really primal things. And I think when you're a kid, you just, you just do what feels good. And me and my sister would just sit in a room and we would just draw like, what was our favorite show at the time? If it was Pokemon or Dragon Ball Z, let's just draw some characters from that. There's no thought to it whatsoever. And if I look back at them now, like some of the drawings are horrible, but it didn't (laughs) matter. Like you just enjoyed the act of drawing and we would still, yeah, do that to like, yeah, we'd still sometimes my sister comes over and she draws in the other room and, you know, I'm doing my work. Like it's still something that we do to this day. So I think it's kind of, yeah, just in, ingrained in us. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's more than just making something. It's like you mentioned, it's more, it's beyond that, especially when you do it as a kid. Although obviously I've spoken to many people and know people who've taken it up in the adulthood and even way later because for whatever reason they just thought i'm not good at it i don't want to do it never had any interest in it um but doing it at a young age obviously like there's a big thing with kids like not just only doing play but the kind of type of play they do you don't want to give them just one you know monotonous thing to keep going over and over and over again it's not good for development for example um whereas drawing is almost like it's kind of like really cool tetris like there's no end to it and you just keep getting better and better and better um but then even things like later on in life and throughout life um just looking at how drawing and art and making things is like used towards helping people with mental health issues or um people who struggle with certain things like neurologically like it helps them too and you know all that kind of stuff um so it's it's interesting how simple it is to adopt and to do yes. there is no although we do give especially in the entertainment industry 
we do give these kind of like maybe arbitrary levels of like what's considered good and bad and etc but honestly if you look at it for anybody they can just pick up a pen and just go ahead and do it um yeah like do you think that's something that's going to be with you forever yeah i think so like um as i mentioned like it was something just kind of in- ingrained in me and i think it kind of always will like there's there's probably two things that i think i'll hopefully do forever which is anything to do with fitness and drawing they're the two things like when i was growing up it was actually like all right, I need I need to either be an athlete or I need to draw for a living. Like saying this when I was like ten or eleven years old, like they were the two things. And I think yeah, still to this day, like they're equal. Drawing and fitness, like they're two things that I will do, like just no matter what. They're two things that are just important. Like you just said, for mental, for just mental health, um, just for just for happiness. Like they're they're the things that just come naturally to me, and that I just want to like keep as a part of my lifestyle, like forever. Like I can't imagine not doing them and i guess we can get into it after if, if you want to but there were periods where i stopped drawing and they were the points when i was really down mm. interesting um can relate to you definitely on that last point i wish i could relate to you on the on the fitness point because <laughs> my fitness levels i don't think i could pass any beep test after the first few beeps um for the time being um but that's something that i really kind of like like reg- not regret because I've gone through those phases where like you know I've been working out a lot loving the benefits for it as well but then I just fall off a cliff and not literally um you know like but my, <laughs> but but my weight just balloons and it's all these kind of like it's actually a lot of bad habits that I've got gotten from working as an artist not doing art but working as an yes. artist and all those kind of habits so that's something that I battle with a lot um but at the same time when I do kind of have that balance it's great um and like you mentioned about having two equal things that's also quite a powerful message to kind of like remind people about as well that you don't we always told like hey what represents you like there's always this one thing or what's this one thing you do your job is normally one thing um like even even a name you only have one name is always this like one kind of thing that you're defined by yet the human mind has a big capacity and you can do many many things quite successfully and as you've shown, it's not just only being a professional, a working professional, but also art and exercise as well and working out and all these kind yeah. of things. And I'm sure there's other things you can add on to it as well. Um, and it's, yeah, that's just like, a, for me, like a very fascinating topic of like how much people are capable of, yet how much we don't like do based on our potential. Yeah. Um, well, like where do you, class yourself in terms of fulfilling your potential let's say human potential because that's quite a loaded question because especially as artists we're never going to say we've reached our maximum level because we always feel like there's always like magnitudes levels above but in terms of like i guess in terms of like things you would like to do and like to achieve what else do you think you would like to be doing on top of what you do already yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's it's funny too because I guess that's kind of hard for me to actually answer that because I guess like everybody's story is unique and where I've gotten to in this point of my career is I feel like I'm the most happiest. Like I'm really con- – like I don't want it to sound like I, I have no goals or anything, but I think like my whole life has been so goal-driven and goal-orientated and, you know, it was wanting to be an architect and then wanting to be a concept artist and you know wanting to be fitter than i've ever been like everything was always kind of thinking about the future and it wasn't until like again 2020 when i finally really broke into the industry that i started to slow down and try to kind of enjoy the fruits of my labor like the things that i actually want to or i have added into my life actually just non-related to exercise and not related um to drawing and they're the really simple things like going going to the country in the middle of the day, like I'm lucky because I live quite close to the countryside and just cool. going with my partner and our dogs and like having a coffee and having a laugh, talking to the locals, like just just enjoying like the outdoors. Like they're the things that I've brought into my life that I actually felt like I was missing when I was working in an office and working in architectural practice. Um, 
yeah, I don't, I don't know if that really answers your question, but like I, um, that's the thing that I've added into my life at the moment that I think I was missing before. I think if I was to think ahead now, I'd like to take that to the next level and potentially experience combining the work, the health, the fitness, the lifestyle overseas. I think it would be nice to to just work from another country and also just just travel more frequently and not just feel like I have to throw away the career and the good habits that I have here at home. Interesting. Um, so have you always been based in Australia? Like, is it always work and everything and career, everything all been nurtured and developed there? Yeah, everything's been here in um, in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I I used to, I think what also a key point of my, my journey to, I guess, becoming a freelance artist is what I mentioned, um, working from the office. Like, I didn't, and I don't mean this to sound like a sob story, but I didn't come off from a well off, a, a well off family. So we weren't traveling frequently, didn't really mm -hmm. get to do um, many things or choose where we wanted to live. So I've always found myself either studying or working really far, really far from the office. Like I think I spent the good six to seven years of my architecture career spending four plus hours a day traveling and that really started to break me. And that was a... Uh, that was something that I knew I needed to change and I didn't know how I was going to get there. Um, but yeah, I'm grateful that I eventually did. Mad. Um, and like, what was the kind of like, cause that's something I'd love to touch upon more in a moment, but like, what's the kind of like appeal to moving abroad? And the reason why I asked that's more from a personal perspective, because like, I guess it's quite obvious kind of like, you know, like what there's always like more to explore, more to see. And I'm sure like, Yep. Whenever and a lot of listeners will agree as well. Whenever you travel somewhere new, um, it's just eye-opening the experience you have when it's completely different to where you live. Like growing up, any kind of holiday we had been on, and even when I started, like you know, away from family holidays, going on my own, it was always been to a hot country, or because obviously Britain's very cold and rainy, um, and it's always <laughs> like a beach or coastal type thing. And then one time, and this was actually work-related. Um, we won an award, I won an award and we got sent to the Alps and I wasn't really keen up, except from the photography perspective um, because I don't like the cold yet it was one of the coolest things ever because it was a completely different experience um, but then at the same time like um, just to quickly bore you with some of, some of my own anecdotes no, go for it, go um, for it. there was a period of say a few years ago where and this is obviously linked with career and like trying to develop and where the best opportunities are, for example, for myself and my family, it was a case of like really thinking about moving abroad and where to move abroad and what's good for us as a family and where the potential jobs are going to be, etc. Yet now that is something that I've completed a 180 on and double down a more case of like, hey, why can't I make it work from being in the exact same spot I want to be in? Um, and doing it that way. So that's kind of like, kind of like, you know, roller coaster journey I've been on. Um, and I'm sure it will change going forward as well. Um, but yeah, for yourself, like what is kind of like the overriding appeal? Like, is it just to kind of see, like you mentioned, um, what that experience would be like? And again, just to kind of, um, like you mentioned, like kind of like to take the career on the road type thing and keep jumping place to place if possible. Um, but yeah, like what's the kind of like overriding or key motivating factor to that? I think um, everything, like I think repetition and um, like having a system to the way that you do things and routine is good, but I think it, everything after a while will start to become boring. So I think traveling and just immersing myself in different cultures mm -hmm. well the appeal there is just like the the richness of knowledge and life experience that you gain and i know like we've heard it so many times with other artists and designers but they then they just affect not only like your happiness but also like the work that you create like you you're constantly mm -hmm. building like this this visual library like you're you're embedding yourself with like just culture and history and um you know, amazing buildings and all these things that just get added into, I guess, your your mental filing system that that you can then just use as your ammunition for when you're um, working on a really cool and exciting project. And I guess I'm kind of like 
addicted to learning. Like I'm a big advocate of, you know, being a student for life and just always wanting to find that next source of inspiration. Like I just, just want to find the next thing and the next thing and just experience as, as many different things as I can just to like, like we were saying, like we always want our work to be better than it was before. You know, you look at something you did yesterday and you don't like it anymore. Like it's, it's just yeah. like a, a natural part of the process. I think I'm sure you feel, feel the same way. Oh yeah, totally. Um, which is, which is interesting because there was someone I was only looking at it recently. I remember when I looked at a piece, I was thinking, oh, what the hell happened there? <laughs> but I remember when I made it, I was thinking, yeah, this is, this is so good. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least at that point in time, I was thinking this is the best thing I can ever do. Um, and I'm actually, I'm glad when I look back at things, I still have that feeling. Um, there's yep. very few where I look back and think, oh, that was actually, that was still hold up today against what I do. Um, cause that's a sign of progress, I guess, you know, it's quite common. It's like, I guess with my kids, when they look back at their drawings or writing or anything they've done from a few years back or a few months back, even like there's an obvious progression when you kind of, kind of look yes. back. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess like kind of a cool little life hack if anyone's kind of thinking if they're stuck in a rut <laughs> just just look back at what you've done before and if you see an improvement yeah. or don't like what you've seen then you're in a good place equally if you don't like what you see now then kind of go back to where it was good and you know kind of like yeah. go back a few steps um yeah. and that yeah. oh sorry no, i was no, just gonna ahead. say okay. just yeah. cut, cut in and that's like just just a super important thing to do like not just to make yourself feel better, but like constantly ref reflect back on your own work and and try and spot where you've improved and if you have improved. Like, I just remember like when I was trying to get into this industry, and I'm sure everybody's had the same experience, but um, like being misguided and comparing yourself to everybody else, all the other great artists that there are out there on Instagram, like it can be, yeah, you can really just... um bring yourself down. And I think you can really get stuck, stuck in a rut, so to say, looking at everybody else's stuff, whereas really you just need to look at your own work and if you've improved. Um, like I, I remember always like thinking to get into the industry, I had to be like Simon Stalenhag. Like I thought that I had to paint, paint like him. And I was just constantly like just beating myself up and just thinking I'm never going to get there. I've got to be like yeah. Simon. Yeah. Which, yeah, should, as we know, we shouldn't be doing that. Now, nah, um, and speaking of Simon or Simons, I had that same thing with Daniel Simon. Um, like it was his book, Cosmic Motors, that opened my eyes to the concept art world and knowing that you can actually be a transport designer for the entertainment industry and do it not only successfully, but in an amazing way in your own voice. It just was like, I thought I had to do that my own way whilst getting into a different industry and then slowly taking steps and maneuvering and you know manipulating things in a way to get it to my world yeah this guy had done it already and it kind of like kind of made the pathway in a way um and then a lot of it was a big big chunk of time where maybe if i had to do a resume of my time it would just be trying to emulate daniel simon and do things yeah you know you fall into that trap where you kind of feel like well you do want to do it your own way but you think oh but his is the accepted way or the perfect way because oh. obviously that's what you kind of idolize. And then you measure yourself up against it, which is, I think, also positive and helpful if you do it in a healthy way. But at the same time, you can really beat yourself up because, yeah, man, it's like trying to trying to run the same record. I, I think it's all got the record as Usain Bolt and trying your best. And you might break your own record like millions of times, but because you're not hitting his record, it's always a failure. Um, yeah. But like, when did you kind of recognize that that wasn't, healthy like was there a certain thing where you think i've had enough yeah. of this i'm gonna work on this pathway or was there something else that kind of like brought you around yeah so with me it's it's funny how it happened so we're going back to my architecture career loved architecture you know learning a lot thought i was you know decent at it spent all this time learning how to design buildings pretty confident and stop me if i go on a too long-winded of a story here but um yeah, in when I finished uni and I graduated, uh, my friend in the office he said to me, and this kind of stuck with me still to this day. He goes, "Now that you've finished studying and you're working full time, make sure you don't go home and all you do is watch MasterChef." Yes, <laughs> <He goes, laughs> not show, that though. there's anything wrong. Not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with MasterChef; it's a great show. But his point was to just keep. You got to keep working on your own drawings and your own designs, 
And I took that advice immediately. I made sure I still had that good routine of creating outside of work. I started an Instagram page with no intent behind it, just literally as a place. And this would have been like 2015, just a place to just to put any drawings that I created outside of work up. No comparison to others. Don't think I even knew what concept art was at the time. Didn't know any other artists really naively. And as it happened, um, some of those drawings, when I, even though I look back at them terribly, some of them went viral. Some of them ended up on like a big um, design blog called Design Boom. Uh, one of them got shared on Hypebeast. Um, and I got all this like attention for them, even though I didn't think that they were that good. And that actually led to me getting my first job in 2016 it, um, at a VFX studio that I mentioned earlier, Plastic Wax in Sydney. And that frightened me. I was like, oh my gosh, what's this concept art career? I've heard of it. Is this what people do? Is this how they design things in film and TV series? And it was that. I took that opportunity. They hired me at the time for me being myself and the architecture that they saw that I was creating. And I, you know, backed myself, just did what I thought I was good at, did a good job at it, whatever. But following that, um, that stint, I then was exposed a bit more to the industry. And then I started to find myself looking at a lot of other artists, looking at concept artwork, which I just found to be, you know, obviously phenomenal and almost scary in a sense. And I almost abandoned all of my architecture knowledge and all of my architecture learning. Like I thought all of a sudden that, okay, I have to be a painter. I have to learn how to be a, a digital artist. Like I have to paint everything. All these people are just doing these amazing paintings. What am I doing doing this 3D, these sterile 3D buildings? <laughs> like I have to I have to try and get into this industry and look at how these people are doing this stuff. And back to drawing when I was, I was young and it being intuitive, I thought naturally that I could, should just be good at drawing. Um, and what I found myself is that I just wasn't up to scratch. So I then spent like all of these years later trying to, trying to mimic all of these different artists and really, really failing and then really starting to, to doubt myself. But the key, I guess, in this whole story was that it wasn't until I reckon 2020, just before the pandemic, that... I was like, okay, I'm not getting much more work. Something's going wrong. Why am I looking at everybody else? What brought me to the dance, so to say? It was my architecture. I've spent all these years trying to be all these other artists and all these people that have different experiences to me, whereas I had this whole career in architecture. I should be using that to my advantage. That's what gave me my first job without me even looking, looking for it. And it wasn't until that I had that epiphany and... I went back to my strengths in architecture and started to basically recreate a whole portfolio with the things that I genuinely loved and I was genuinely passionate about that as a byproduct, I just started to get work. I started to get mm -hmm. inquiries, people emailing me, messages on ArtStation and people looking specifically for architectural concepts um, and which I'm doing to, to this day, which I'm super grateful that I actually came to that epiphany finally. <laughs> Do you think that if you had that kind of, let's say, not the epiphany that you had, but let's say you stuck with that strategy from the very beginning, do you think that versus going about it the way it happened for you with having to go through all those things and then going backwards to what you were good at or what you were passionate about, what was, I guess, your strongest skill set at? Um, which one do you think would have been better? Do you think it would have been a case of like yeah. having those little stumbles and going, trying all these different things, and I guess in the buffet cart, so to speak, um, before you went back to that original platter? Yeah, I think like your instinct is always saying, damn, I wish I did that. But I kind of don't regret anything because yeah. I think it always like it. It, it makes you who you are. Those those experiences, those failures, they are they have. I guess what brought me to where I am now in my career. Like if I didn't go through that, um, then who knows? Maybe I wouldn't be um, in the position I'm at at the moment. Like I've actually found too that all those years of trying to learn the fundamentals again of like digital painting and all of those basics that that I didn't have from architecture. That combined now with my architectural knowledge and the 3D skills, that has all blended really seamlessly. Like I wouldn't call myself, I guess, when I do 3D 
3 d work like I don't have the best skills in doing, for example, um, really like fluid geometry or really organic geometry. But all of a sudden, like now I can combine my basic knowledge in 3D software with my painting skills and I can get um, results I wouldn't have got if I had just stuck to the architecture route and doing, thing re- doing things really rigidly. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, yeah. totally. And it's almost like, I guess, the you stumbled upon... Um, and discovered like the, the perfect, I guess you you could say, um, development path where people can like you you could do that same thing again if you wanted to, but this time would be intentional. And I guess there wouldn't be a lot of the kind of you know the kind of anxiety. And I'm speaking also from my own experience because I went through the exact same thing um, in a similar way, almost to the T. Where it was like, oh, looking at other artists or looking at what I thought you needed to be in the industry. Um, and then almost coming full circle it, for the same reason was a case of, well, this is what I actually do. This is what my biggest strengths are. Um, and then it's a case of like bringing all that kind of back together. And then it, again, if you look at it differently, let's say your intention at the beginning was a case of like, okay, this is where I'm going to end up. I'm going to go full circle, but I'm going to strategically and intentionally go down the path of like, you know, like painting and doing all these different things. Then when you reach the end goal, Again, it's still be the same result, but I guess perhaps there wouldn't be, you know, that kind of like the, the negative you know, take that that you'd went through. However, negative obviously is a bad thing, hence the name. But at the same time, do you think it's important to have negative experiences in your career? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think you have to have um, negative experiences, whether it's like rejection or failure. Like, I think those are the only things that can really make you grow. Um, like I think they help you develop like a strong mindset, but they also push you to, to learn more and to grow in whatever profession or industry you're in. Um, like I went through the period of when I was trying to, you know, get into, um, concept art that I was sending my portfolio um, to people on LinkedIn or in emails or whatever it may have been. And people telling me that, yeah, look, your stuff doesn't look realistic enough for what we do. It's too painterly. Like it's too painterly. I went through this stage where I was just kind of doing digital paintings and not using any 3D. And I was like, damn, I just ditched all the 3D stuff and went down the the digital painting route and it's still not getting me work. And you have to have those those negative experiences to, to push you in a direction. Um, that's why even I, I'm grateful for the, the, the bad times that I had in the architecture industry, like, um, being pushed down, saying, no, you're not allowed to design. You have to just do your drawings. Like those are the, those are the negative experiences that, that pushed me forward to like pursue a passion and Mm. to, and to, to pursue getting, um, getting into this space. Um, yeah. Yeah. That is also an interesting topic as well, where it's a case of, like you just explained, like literally, like, don't don't be creative. Um, and like I have been in, for a long time, in my working career, in a non-creative job. And it was always like kind of, because I didn't realise, but you're trying to find ways to be kind of creative, but it's, it's not nothing meaningful. Um, but then at the same time, like you're in a somewhat creative industry, well, it is a creative industry because you're creating these amazing things. Um, but yet you're told not to, and I'm sure there's people who decided that, well, I have to listen and not do it. Um, but, but in your case, was it, did you ever think about like, okay, I'm gonna have to listen and not do this? Or was it just like, you were never going to compromise on pursuing something that allowed you to be creative? Yeah, I think there was, I think there was certain moments where I just kind of took it on on board and just thought, oh, this is just what the industry must be like, mm-hmm. like naively thinking, oh, I can't change it. I'm just, I just have to do my job. Um, but I think you can only take that so much, especially like yourself, like learning and studying at university to be a designer and to have these big visions. You can only kind of been pushed down for, for so long to the point that, like you were saying, you go through, start going through the negative experiences. You start getting to the point of I'm get mentally breaking, which I I almost had, and I had to decide that I need to change this. I can't. Mm. I remember just sitting there. I, I was like doing some weights in the morning before I was off to work, and I just stopped. And I was like, I can't keep doing this. 
how, um, is this the rest of my is this the rest of my life like i know it sounds really dramatic but that's exactly what i was thinking i was like something has to change and that that led me to the path of um okay i really need to again learn how to draw i need to learn my fundamentals i need to i need to create a portfolio that is going to get me work and into the industry and that pushed me to become um you know, really persistent. I would spend mornings, my lunch times, and immediately after work, sitting on my iPad. It didn't matter if it was like middle of summer. I'd be sitting in my car on the iPad, learning how to draw on my lunch break. Like I just did. I spent a solid year and a half doing that to just really break out of um, that routine that I was in, and and being in that job that I just got to the point of hating. If I'm being honest. Yeah. Love it. Um, because I did the same. Like, you, A, for two reasons. It's something you couldn't escape or give up. Um, like, whenever I'd go on like, any lads' holidays or any trips, even on my lunch break, everything revolved around, okay, any free time that I have, it's going to be me doing some kind of art or creativity and everyone leave me alone kind of thing. Um, and, like, it's funny because my work colleagues got used to it. My family get used to it. It's just, it is what it is. You just can't shake it. Um but at the same time, you know, like, again, I can totally relate. It was a case of, I don't know how it was for you, but it was a case of like, oh, is this going to be like this all the time? Like, am I going to not be able to not only make a living being a creative, but am I going to have a job that's not going to let me create forever? And at times you'd always kind of believe it. And at times you'd be like, and it's never going to happen. And you start making the steps to pursue and obviously fast forward and I'm also speaking directly to the people listening now who are kind of in that same position. Um, yep. We're both testament to that you will end up there. You will end up in the place you want to be because we didn't stop. And that's, I guess, what the, the, the true message is. But with that said, were there any ever times where you just thought, okay, I have to stop. Like, I'm going to give up. Because you kind of lose that earlier a little bit. Um, but I yep. if that was more of just the drawing side of things. But did you ever get to the point where you're thinking, okay, I have to compromise. I have to stop this art dream. Yeah, absolutely. And it was a horrible feeling. I remember like, like I was saying, like those mental battles building up. And when I look back at it now, like coming to see my partner straight after work and just almost breaking down to her, like just being honest, like I was just like, I can't keep doing this. I, I think I just have to accept that I'm not going to, my creative dreams just aren't going to exist. Like I, I vividly remember talking to her that, and I'm, I'm so lucky that I had her because she would get so like upset that if, when she heard that I was going to give up on my dreams. Like she, it's so important, I guess as well, just to have, you know, family and friends or your partner around you to, to really believe in you and have those people that, that know your potential and just won't stop to push you in that right direction. And she was that person always saying, trust me, things are going to change. Like you, you've done put in all this hard work, like it's going to happen. I know it. And just hearing that helps. And believe it or not, from that point where I nearly gave up the week after, it's amazing how an email can change your life. I got an email from another VFX and animation studio. It had been a long time since I got any freelance work. And it was a really big job. It was the, um, uh, which we've spoke about in the past, the, um, the music video um, for Pharrell Williams. And I could not believe that. I was just like, this is the, this is the sign. This is, this is the sign that all of that hard work has come to a point where somebody has seen my work and I need to take the leap of faith, um, and which I did. I actually did something which was, I guess, which would be scary for anybody else that had had a secure job for a, for a, a long amount of time. And I actually quit. I used that as the point that even though it was only a job for two weeks, I was like, I analyzed my whole s uh, situation. I was like, okay, how much money do I have? Do I have enough money to last me for like six to 12 months? I analyzed all of that. I'm like, this is it. I'm taking this opportunity. This is my chance to go full steam ahead. Throw away all of the safety nets that I've had around me, the secure income, that lifestyle, and I'm just going to go into the unknown. And I did that. 
and it's been nearly three years since then and i haven't looked back <laughs> sick love it love it um and yeah that this that, that cool thing about you mentioned about safety nets um i remember doing a similar thing where it's a case of like i got really attached to those safety nets because in the day and age we live in and the, the way things are with prices and just everything else like having steady income is almost the only thing that you should hope for almost that's kind of the message that is instilled in us and it's yep. it's valid um but at the same time there's something where as long as you're driven and you're smart about it of course as well like you, you did the calculations you did you assessed everything you didn't just go blindly into it but removing those safety nets you pay more attention you you make yes. sure things happen that's supposed to happen and i'm sure it's the same thing for yourself is a case of like going back to that stage is almost like the key motivation to make sure that you never go back to that stage because yeah. um yeah it's like that old adage of like when people leave prison say i'm never gonna go back i'd rather die it's like i, yes. I, I kind of get what they mean um except yeah. the lack of criminality <laughs> we hope um yeah but that's it that's a good really good point like because something else i always believed like deep down as well is i was like you know what if i had five days a week to spend this is back before i worked in in concept art if i had all that time and i guess it's easy to say this if i had all that time and i spent all that time even without the job just dedicated to my art and getting better and networking creating a portfolio if i dedicate myself full time to that jobs will come from it and i just kept telling myself that because after i yeah. did get that two-week job it's not like i had a job after that but i treated the rest or the, the months to follow as full-time work. It doesn't matter I wasn't receiving an income. That's that's irrelevant. Like my job is to get more work mm -hmm. and I can't let any time slip. I do not, like you just said, you don't want to go back to that. And I would, I'll do anything. Like I said, like I'd rather go work at the supermarket stacking shelves again, as I did in my first job, than Safe. going yeah. back to that, that architecture office that I worked in. Yeah. Um, so you're the same, you're the same. Oh yeah, some similar thing. But a lot yeah. of mine was like, my break came a couple of years before yourself. Um, but it's, it's not been like, it's still been up and down. It still hasn't steadied yet. But yep. as it was at the beginning, there's no, well, there's always going to be some anxiety, but there's no anxiety in terms of like, what and ifs and maybes and whatever. Like it's pretty clear what needs to be done, what I need to do. And yep. then it's just maneuvering how you want to kind of maneuver. Um, but prior to that, it was just after I'd left uni and then I already had like a weekend job that kind of became my main job because I'd left uni and then that stayed my main job. And then I got, <laughs> I got made redundant and then got another similar job. And then I only left that officially when the pandemic hit. Um, but I'd been slowly whittling down the hours because freelancers were picking up and you know it's kind of like minute a bit like um in Raiders of the Last Ark when they're trying to move the statue and put the put the thingy there yes. <laughs> like I kind of did it where the giant stone ball didn't come after me so I, I did it the right way but it took ages um but yeah it was a case of like exactly like yourself that motivation of you know but if I was doing this then this would be exactly what I need and yeah that mentality like I can relate to it but I also love to hear it as well because there's a big thing which is said about making your own opportunities and obviously at the same time you can't just force people to send you emails like like the one that you got for example you can't force people to give the work that you want but at the same time um okay that, that's something that you can't control but there's so much you can control and a lot of it is to do with giving yourself that mental structure like you've just explained and also that framework to make sure that you're just at peak performance and as someone who works in well who does fitness and does working out i'm sure that's very similar to yeah. working out as well right like it's a case of knowing what your limits are making sure that you don't fall off the wagon like i normally do um because it's hard <laughs> to get back on um and and it's interesting like how a lot of these things follow the sim same rules even though they're very very different yes 100 percent. yeah um, that that like i'm glad you brought yeah. oh sorry no no go, no, no, no. Go. it was going to be that it was like i guess i'm sure you're going to go into it but like yeah. what what is the key thing that you take from all these other pursuits that you do that 
fit perfectly well into helping you as a professional? So, um, yeah, going off of what you've just said, I can relate going to the gym, being healthy and as fit as I can to everything else that I do in my life, like in terms of relating that to the career. Like, as you know, like when you go to the gym, like everything's about repetition. Like you have to be repetitive in what you do. You have to be consistent. And at the gym, you also have to have progressive overload. So you need to constantly be pushing yourself to do better than what you did the day before. And like I always remind myself of those rules and those principles because they apply to anything else we do in, in life and especially in art and design. Like you have to ask yourself, if well, if you go to the, like you just said, you can go to the gym for three months, but then if you stop for three months, are you going to be getting any better? No, you have to, you have to be consistent. You have to be going every day, like not every day, every week you have to be consistent. You have to be showing up and um, actually on that too, like another good um, lesson, I guess I was listening to, I think it was on the Lucid Pixel podcast, like Anthony Jones said something that really resonated with me and he was talking about that a professional shows up no matter what and he talked mm. about something called art debt and he was saying what happens if you don't if you just keep waiting for the right, I'm, I'm butchering what he said, but it was, I'm paraphrasing, but um, you have to show up every day, no matter how you feel in order to get better. Otherwise you build up this, this debt that you're going to pay for in the future. Like the worst thing you would want in, in a year from now is to say, oh my gosh, I wish I actually did drawing every week. Imagine how good I could be by now. But instead you you gain all of this debt and you look back and you haven't progressed any further than where you were last year. And for me, that's like the biggest thing I'm afraid of. And I never want to let myself get to that point. Yeah. It's that and it's interesting as well, like how fears are very beneficial in terms of keeping you motivated. You know, it's almost like, yep. you know, when with the children, we scare the shit out of them to make sure they stay in line. It's kind of like you can kind of still do it to yourself as a grown up, yeah. or sometimes it can go bad. Um, but there, that, that's that's super interesting. And I've also had the pleasure of like in my time with working many people is like meeting people who have also in the past have pursued creative pursuits, like so many different fields, like from music to all types of the arts, and even like just something completely different but they've stopped for different reasons. Obviously things that we mentioned before, like life getting in the way or life being something that's kind of like slowed you down a little bit or making you think that I can't do this anymore because it's not the thing that's going to get me anywhere. Um, and then they've just kind of built that debt up to the point where they're like, I'm not going to cash it and forget it. I'll make them forget yeah. and they're never going to cash it in and I'm not going to be in debt, which I've always found tragic because you can see how happy they are when they talk about that topic. And yeah. there's something about pursuing the stuff that you want to pursue, how awesome it makes things that tend to not be awesome be. Like, you know, like you have a better yeah. outlook on things. You just seem to be more zen about things that probably you wouldn't be otherwise. Um, so yeah, I just thought I'd like kind of just um, follow up with that kind of note because it's, Again, just to people who are thinking like, you know, are the same thing or like, hey, let's just give up. Let's just not do this. Um, I didn't get my break until my 30s. And I know there's some people who are well into their 30s or beyond who are thinking there's no point now. What's the point? Just don't, man, because you're going to yeah, regret yep. it. You're going to regret it. Uh, absolutely. Me too. Like I'm, I started to get those, those thoughts as well of that by the time like age was creeping up and not that it honestly doesn't matter, but I'd be lying if I, if I said that it, I wasn't thinking about that. And like I was getting to like, I got to I think 29 and I was like, oh, I always wanted to be a concept. I can't, if I get over <laughs> 30, I'm never going to be a concept artist. Yeah. Like I just had that age for some reason in my head. And I thought I'm too old now. Like I can't just change careers, but I honestly, obviously just kept fighting that, that thought. And, um, and, yeah. Oh, sorry, go. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, just to, just to carry on what you just said before, um, I think it was like, um, again, I'm going to paraphrase and butcher the quote, but like, um, you know, Conor McGregor, the UFC fighter. Yeah. His, his coach, John Kavanagh, like said something along the lines of people are, are, are afraid to fail. And he's just like, but you know what's sad to me is like 
is a life of somebody that just didn't try. Like imagine looking back in 20 years and realizing that you actually never even gave it a go. That's true failure rather than trying and failing. And that's something else that really stuck with me. And something similar that was said as well, um, which links it nicely, is actually that Farah had said. Um, and like, I don't really have... The, uh, the word heroes I find is funny, or idols I find funny. Um, but yet, there are some people that have been super inspirational to people that I look up to. Pharrell, the Neptunes are like right up there. Like, if you can see the top of my screen now, like it's almost well, on that line, <laughs> right? The top. Um, and there's something that he said because... He's like a super creative in many different aspects. Um, and I'm not sure how much input he had in the, the Cash and Cash Out video, for example, but it's one of the coolest videos I've seen um, in a very, very long time, especially in music video terms. Um, but there's something that he said, and it was about, because I'm like heavily into beat making and music, a bit like, well, exactly like how you are with the fitness side of things. Um, it's just something that I can never escape and I would never want to escape from. It's just... It That's gets awesome. as much attention from me as my art does. Um, but there's something that he mentioned, and it was about people just making and doing the thing that they want or the ideas that they have. Um, and the point he was saying that because he was like saying, just do it because there's millions of people out there that want to do the same thing and they'll do it before you. And if you're the first person to yep. do it because you went through the idea, then it's fine. And he was also, the point he was trying to make was like people can have inspirations, but ultimately what they want to do is take what you have in terms of like the creative aspect kind of thing. If that, that makes sense, like I'm definitely butchering what he said, but the key takeaway was, was don't dwell and don't sit on your ideas and the things of like what if and what have. And ironically, like I have done that a little bit not for that reason of I like, thinking my is not good enough, but I thought I haven't got time. I'll wait it out a little bit. Fast forward and I'm seeing things that I had in mind. Others are doing and I'm thinking, oh man, I had that idea X amount of time ago and I'm not sure if it would have been any better or it would have achieved better results, for example. But, but yeah, that thing straight popped back into my mind as a yeah. case of like, you just got to keep pursuing. Yeah, absolutely. Like you, you have to you have to try it like and just I think that's a good point to lead on to as well is like you need something to critique as well. Like you have to actually get something out of your head and put it put it to paper, like to just see if it was worth it or not, or if it's something you're an idea you're happy with or interested in. Cause otherwise, like if you don't get it out of your mind, like you just like you just regret it. Like you always be again wondering what if. Um, and also with creative minds, we have way too many ideas sometimes. Um, and I'm sure the same thing goes for yourself as well. Like, how do you keep track of them? Like, do you have a certain workflow in terms of like making sure that you don't lose the good ideas or do you just kind of just go with what's popping at the time? Yeah, it's funny. I guess it, it's different. Oh, actually, maybe it, it differs a little bit from like um, client work to personal work. Like I find... I do always find myself like as soon as I have something, even if I'm like driving, like I'll pull over and I'll get my phone out and I'll have a notes page with like ideas and I'll just write them down just so that I can refer to them when I get back home or the next morning and I can see if that was a, a good idea or not. Um, in terms of like the creative process, I, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, like responding to a, a brief is, is important for me. I feel like that's where I, I perform at my best. Like in, in client work, like the, the first thing I do is I always write first. Like I'll write down key, key words that a director has told me or a production designer. I'll find key words or key sentences or key moments in a script. Like I always write things down so I can like physically look at them and see them. And I find that ideas will start to spark from looking at those words. And then I'll find myself like if something pops into my head, I'll quickly draw in my book terribly like but i'll have a sketchbook everywhere with me like i'll draw a little quick section or a quick plan or a little perspective just to get that idea out and again going back to what we we're saying so i have something to critique like in my head it might sound like it's a good idea but i can never tell if it's going to be an idea worth pursuing unless i can physically look at it interesting um and in terms of like i guess your 
general workflow in terms of creating, I guess, from beginning to end, yeah. like, I guess, how would you define your style? Like, would you say you're quite organized? Do you have a structure you always follow? Or is it more open, depending on whatever the project is? Um, it does change a little bit depending on on the project and like what the what the task is. Like again, like something that I kind of have built for myself, I guess, is I get hired to do architectural concepts for film and games. So like I do have a bit of a process um, in terms of that. But I didn't just like um, it's only something probably again recent in the last few years where I've started to feel a lot more confident with my process. Um, like I went through the period of like a feeling like before I had to draw everything out first in my sketchbook to really understand it. Mm -hmm. But now I'm at the point where I find myself diving into 3D really early. Like I found that I was starting to get stuck a lot creatively um, when I would just be drawing too long in my yeah. sketchbook. Like I, I was just like, I realized like, look, I'm losing time in the day. It's 11 in the morning. I've lost a couple of hours. I'm not getting anywhere. I just need to model something. I just need to get a mass on the screen and I can start to see how these proportions are looking like. And as soon as I do that, it feels like this weight is lifted off of my shoulders because mm. I have something to look at. I can see if the idea is no good and almost like the, the process, the creative process from there starts to flow a lot more naturally. It's almost like working with clay. You can start mm. to mold it and start to shape it. Whereas it goes back to what we're saying again, like otherwise if we're just stuck sitting there thinking, um, we can just get lost and just wonder, just find ourselves wondering way too much. Like it just yeah. got to, again, the act of doing, get yeah. into it, have something to look at. And that's like, I guess the creative process in a nutshell, right? Like yeah. we always see, and we always present the finished item, even if it's in the sketch as well, we always present the finished part of the sketch, not every single stage. And there's obviously logical reasons why. Um, and also people in the job, isn't, they don't need to see all that kind of stuff. Um, but at the same time, like, I've been listening to um, even authors recently as well on like how they write books and stuff. And it's very similar, like how they go back and chop and change things and the structures they have almost like they sketch out things and then, you know, the type of thing, things afterwards, obviously with music as well, there's almost like so many things that, that chop and change um, before they become what they become. Um, and yeah, like same thing with 3D. I always, like lately for myself even, I find starting off in 3D is what I do more often before it even ends up in a sketch and then sometimes back and forwards in a loop as well. Um, yes. But I guess even with your training that you've had, I'm pretty sure it's been beneficial because you kind of use the full spectrum, right? Like from theory to the sketching and the design work on paper yep. and then switching into 3D. Like, do you find that that kind of like changes sometimes like you know you prefer one over the other or are you finding that your habits are kind of changing and shifting with i guess perhaps the technologies that are advancing now especially with 3d and how quick it is to do anything in blender now um versus how it used to be before um but yeah like what's your relationship with the kind of like tools and technologies for example yeah i've, I've always i think i've always been um able to adapt to new technologies and tools. Like for me, it's always just been about, will it help me get to my final result quicker? Like I'm not too fussed about, like I used to be, like even when I went through that digital painting learning stage, like I got stuck into the thing of, oh, don't touch uh, 3D or photo bash, you're a cheater. <laughs> like I, I went through that route, like I think everybody else else did. But um, yeah, like obviously well, I use Blender now. So jumping into that, like has just been, it's been like it's been incredible like for the for client work and for personal work like just in terms of like how fluid it is to use um like i was using rhino before that and it was very i started to i'm sorry for anybody that uses it but i really started to hate it i actually started to hate 3d because of that software like i think just because for me with architecture like it felt very limited in terms of like exploring mm -hmm. like spaces and shapes and forms and it was very rigid and along comes blender and start to use that and start to see how much more fluid and intuitive it is to use and then all of a sudden the it made i was talking to some other artists about this too it's made 3d fun again well for me anyway and for some of the others that i've spoken to like before i i was kind of dreading it a lot in the architecture days 
um, I just I hated opening 3D software back then. But now, like I've, I've, yeah, I've fallen in love with it again. Like it, it makes the creative process a lot more easier, a lot more fun. And actually, probably to better answer your question as well is in particular, like with deadlines, like something like Eevee and real time rendering has just been such a game changer. Like I know Cycles is great, but like I've barely even dived into it because for the purposes of my job, like I can hit screenshot and just do a quick paint over and that serves its purpose for the job, like on a lot of the jobs um, that I do. So just that and not having to wait for something to render out has just, yeah, it's been such a good tool to have up my sleeve. Yeah, like how much that has advanced when you think about it is actually crazy and maybe something that we generally, especially people who are just jumping in on it and that's been the, all they've known is like how Blender is right now. Yeah. Like it's definitely something I take for granted because Maya was the first thing. No, no, Alias was the first thing I was taught in terms of 3D. That was way back at uni, over a decade ago now. Um, and then he switched to Maya. And yeah, like I remember having similar things with Alias, where it was a case of like, yeah, getting some PTSD just thinking about it right now. Um, <laughs> but like, even, even like say the rendering side of things, it was just a whole thing um, before you even got something to look at. And now it's almost, well, it is instant, which is, which, which is good because... Like you mentioned, it's more intuitive. You can visualize things better. You can get to your solution quicker. Like you don't, it doesn't need to be this whole technical thing just to get a very quick answer to something. Which yeah, I, for I, productivity and design, like that's what it's all about, right? Like you want to quickly uh, get the idea, communicate it, evaluate it, evolve it, and then go back into the whole process again. Oh, you're, you're 100% right. Like for me, the most important thing is design. Like, that outweighs everything. Yes, we need to be able to um, visualize, visualize our ideas and have them on paper and make them look nice eventually. But I think, oh, well, for me anyway, and I think it's super important for all the jobs that I've worked on is like being able to have logic and understanding and and create like meaningful design is the most important thing. Like that is number one priority, as I'm sure you can agree with your background in industrial design. Like that goes at the top of the list. <laughs> like, I think we can get misguided a little bit with social media and seeing beautiful images and pretty renders and thinking that's what we have to do. Like, I, that was me too. I thought that's all I had to do. But nobody sees the rough stuff that we do on a daily basis. Nobody sees the crappy sketches, the quick screenshots that I was talking about. Like, because all that matters at the end of the day and what your production designer or art director or whoever it is, they just want a design that is going to successfully sell their story being told. And that is the priority. So whatever the tool is, as long as the tool can get get me to focus most of my time on design, like it's a it's a winner for me. Doesn't matter what it is. Yeah, definitely. And I think even the long way around, I think a lot of people will come to that conclusion. And I think the industry yeah. in general is headed to the point where like the general consensus is obviously Tech, being technically good, being technically exceptional is yeah. important. And we'll, you'll always get there. As long as you practice something, you'll always get there. But the the design and the, the thinking behind it and the strategy behind it, that is what's really going to ensure you have longevity in this industry above, yeah. all, above all else. Um, and just to just to you mentioned there as well, that's something that I've definitely fallen back in love with interestingly which is an odd thing to say because it's always kind of been there but I definitely pursued the other stuff for a big chunk of time where it's a case of like yeah. the techniques the tools and similar pathway to yourself like they come full circle and you can use them but um, yeah it's, it's interesting how we quickly get lost and pursue these different side quests that you becomes your yeah. main quest then you realise that oh that's not the game at all the game is back what it's on before yeah, yeah, and like on the the film that I was just working on at Twentieth Century, like they just the production design on that film, it was just so refreshing and comforting to hear. The first thing he said to me in the first meeting we met, we met, he was like, "I know you can do sexy renders. I know you can do badass renders. I don't give a shit about that. <laughs> I want the rough stuff. I want ideas." I want you to explore your designs, your proportions, your shapes. I want the options. I don't care how crap it looks. When the time comes, we'll tell you to do a nice render, but don't worry about it until until I tell you. 
and like that that's that's the best thing to hear and i think it's super important for people listening on this show to hear that because I too was the person like, this is embarrassing, but like <laughs> when I was trying to get into the industry, like I'm looking at like the last of us art and I'm thinking, how the F do these people do this on a daily basis? I can't do a couple of those a day. Yeah. How am I going to get into concept art? Like I thought, I thought that's all you present. Like I think there's that, that misconception on social media that if you don't have any insight, like me, like here in Melbourne, I felt like concept art didn't even exist. And just seeing all this concept art on people's pages and all these beautiful renders and these amazing landscapes. And I'm just like, how the hell am I going to become that good to produce that in a day? And it wasn't until, you know, getting experience and working with production designers and experienced artists that you start to see that it's not about that at all. Like, there's a lot that goes into it behind the scenes that that we don't see. Like, um, and just to piggyback on that too, like I... With my short career in concept art, it's only been full time, like I said, three years. I hope too that when some of this stuff comes out that I can uh, not contradict uh, myself and actually <laughs> share a lot of the rough stuff. That's what I'm aiming to do and I hope to do. Like I want to show the stuff just to help other people as well because I know how it feels like to get intimidated by all this beautiful imagery out there. I would really want to show like the stuff that I did on a daily basis, like the screenshots with the notes, like. I spend a lot of my time like doing screenshots and writing notes to get my ideas across. Like, yeah. I think they're important things to see. No, definitely. And that's something I want to commend you on because looking through your work and interestingly enough, like the finished stuff is always amazing. Like your, your, your best films obviously is, is the finished stuff, but seeing your sketches, seeing how your thought process is and the little notes as well. Um, obviously they're all intentional it's not there for show um, yeah. but like that's the coolest thing I love to see that all the way throughout like even um, some of the legends like you know Sid Mead stuff I love seeing yep. oh, yes. the sketches before the finished painting and oh, everything else like you know it's, it's, it's just something I think maybe it's not for everybody but for yeah. us creatives it's like when Neo sees all the ones and zeros he sees the code like that is what it yes. is like for us. Like yeah. it's a case of like, yeah. oh, that, that's that's what you need. Um, and Ooh. um, in terms of like your experiences on the productions you've worked on now, is a lot of it like that? Is a lot of it the rough stuff? Yeah. Yep. Uh, the amount of times I've been told just rough stuff. Don't spend too much time on it. Like that's what I get a lot of the time. And I wish I knew that before mm -hmm. I got into the industry, because I remember like some of the earlier jobs I was trying to produce like. Um, keyframes like on the first go and <laughs> and i was just driving myself into the ground it's like now when i look back at it, i was like what was i doing yeah but um and yet not not to toot my own horn but like some of the feedback i got after like um the films that i worked on this year was that you know what we loved we loved how you would communicate like through notes and annotation and put those ideas onto the page they go because sometimes like the production designer said to me Sometimes I'm looking at your stuff at six in the morning or 10 at night and I look mm -hmm. at it and I'm like, yeah, it looks all right. It looks cool. But when you start to point out these things and you start to annotate and you start to show your ideas and your philosophies and your thinking behind these certain design moves, that sells them on the idea. And and all of a sudden they can get an understanding into your thought process and why why you made certain design gestures and moves. And that is just like, I can just see how invaluable that is because you're not going to get as well... I've heard a lot of artists too that just um, hearing from production designers about other artists that like just go off on their own tangent, create what they think and they just send it through and don't say anything. And the production designer's like, okay, what is this? Like, You yeah. need to have a thought and reasoning behind certain things in order to do a good job at what you're doing. Totally. And it's definitely a byproduct and the influence, pun intended, of social media because obviously that its own nature is about clicks and likes and whether you choose to or not in the end, the algorithm we get to you, it always wins like one way or another. It, you're always going to end up like, it's interesting. It's like, it's like this very slow pull of gravity. And if you give it enough time, it will end up in that same place. And interestingly, if our industry had its own social media, the stuff on there would follow the same rules, but it wouldn't be the finished stuff. It would be the sketches. It would be, the amazing, you know, sketches from um, all of the Aliens films, for example, like, you know, the, yeah. the, um, 
oh, the, the uh, space jockeys and all that kind of stuff and the geeky yeah, stuff yeah. like you know um just see the thought process behind it the set design and as much as i love films i always love the making of like you know why yes. people did it um what their intentions are why they did things because obviously that's they speak my language and it's cool to see why people did the things they did and generally you always hear like especially when it comes to marketing you always hear hey with this amazing you know like revolutionary thing and no one else could do it and we're awesome which is great for the general fan but for the creative we, we know there was more to it um yeah and like even when you look back at the making of lord of the rings the fact that the two key artists and creatives that drove that production pretty much used pencil and paper yep. on this revolutionary CGI film, that, that's all you need to know. Yeah. And that's the stuff that, like you just said, that that's what gets the creative juices flowing. And that's what makes you want to go back to your desk and start drawing when you see that stuff, when you see the behind the scenes stuff. You saw, you saw, you know, Sid Mead's napkin sketch or whoever it may have been. Like that's the stuff that gets you excited. Like you, you I think because oh. for us, for us, like you just, it's like our language, like you just said, it's our language. It's how we connect to them. And it makes us feel like we're, we're one of them and that we can be a part of like the projects that they, they worked on. Now, 1 million percent. It's almost like, like I love science stuff. I love space stuff. I love discoveries. And I love, I love the space shows where they, you know, they, they show, you know, the universe and how things are, the scale of things. It's just fascinating. And obviously we always see like the, the visual renders. We, we like, for example, Gargantua in Interstellar. Like it's super cool because it looks awesome. Um, it's even cooler because it's based on actual real life math and science. But yes. the guy who um came up with the formula, he just literally represented it in mathematical formula. And that's all they need to see to understand these things. Yeah, we need to see it like yeah. obviously visually and stuff, but for them. Or for us, that is like seeing E equals MC squared. Like, you know, like for example, yes. um, with the cash and cash at work, like seeing the little examples that we were like, you know, having it this way would make it more potentially visually interesting. Like those are anecdotes. Yeah. Like obviously when I saw it, I was thinking, okay, these are explorations, but there's something powerful in that little note and that design yeah. thinking. And like, is that something that happens a lot in architecture generally based on, you know, like the training stuff? Is that something that you just put in yourself yeah well so that's a good point because in architecture you gotta remember somebody has to build this and it's the same in film like if they're building the sets somebody needs to know why you drew something a certain way so when the greatest thing i learned in architectural practice was the construction side of it when you have to produce construction drawing so that somebody can build this expensive building the builder needs to needs it and not dumb down, like to say they're dumb, they're amazing at what they do. Like you need it in layman's terms. You, they need to understand why this junction is a certain way. Mm. And you have to spend a lot of your time annotating everything. Like you spend so much time in documentation and architecture, annotate, uh, annotating every material, every joint, every um, little piece of metal, every corner, like why it is that way. And I think that's something that I've carried on into into the entertainment industry and it seems like it's something that's that's working well from the feedback that i've got which is which is good to know because again like the film that i just finished on and as i mentioned to you before we got on uh on recording i can't wait to see what it is <laughs> um yeah that like they're building some of those sets now and like i went through the same process of annotating my drawings and making sure that there's certain design moves that I made so that the set designers and the art directors know why I put something there or why I designed something a certain way. Like I think it's important for us to, co to communicate, communicate those, those thoughts. And I think again, it's like um, a very good lesson, especially for myself that I'm taking on board for sure is the communication goes beyond just, you know, like speaking. And even typing, yes. you know, it's like we're visual artists and communicating it as simply as possible in a visual way is what's going to make the difference between you being an asset to your clients and to your production and even to your own projects as well, then not. And yes, speaking about formulas, I guess like that's the simplest formula you need to follow, right? Like you just need to be an asset. And the way to be an asset is 
almost be exactly what they need. And that doesn't always mean in terms of flair, like you've explained, doesn't need to always be in terms of even visual style. It's just solving the problem, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think something, I, I think in terms of making yourself valuable, a valuable part of the process too, well, for me anyway, with my own experience and my own skill sets is um, like I always just try to, Try to like give respect as well to whoever you're working with, like the the director or the production designer. Like with a script, for example, like to say a director's gotten you to design a certain space or scene in the film. Like rather than you just going and doing something what you think looks cool, like you almost owe it to them to tell to tell them why you made something look a certain way. Like something I like to think about when I'm designing in terms of. I guess everything I do is architecture anyway, but I love to think about just proportions, like how proportions can tell a story. And if I've designed proportions a certain way, like I'm going to put that extra level of information on the top of it to explain to the director, why have I made this ceiling low? Like it's because your key part of the story is the character, for example, has a lot of weight on their shoulders. They're in a really tough position in, mm -hmm. in their, um, in their story. So, maybe the proportions of this space are really low. So then all of a sudden you start to create this weight on the character and like, you're almost like explaining to the director, you know, you, you know, that their work, you know, their script, like you've got a respect for it. You're trying to make something specific for them and their story. And that's something I think that can make you really valuable in terms of what you do is like having that level of connection with, um, with your brief and, and your client. Amazing advice. Um, in terms of like inspirations for yourself, what movies, even games or TV or anything, um, inspire you? I guess like from an architectural perspective, or in terms of like designing spaces, like you just explained. Yeah. What examples jump to you straight away? That kind of did that what you just explained, like in terms of like you know messing with proportions or the space adding to the story based on the script and all these yep. things. Um, which ones do it best for you? Yeah, well, I'm probably going to go with some recency bias here, but um, <laughs> like some ones that come to mind immediately that I was thinking about was like in Dune, the like Iraqi and like uh, palace, like we've seen pyramids done before, yes, like done to death in science fiction. But once you start to delve into the behind the scenes and why the production designer wanted things a certain way, you start to gain a really good appreciation for it. And that's the stuff that gets me excited and motivated. So and I hope I'm not butchering it too, but I just remember reading like with the Iraqi palace, like those sloping walls of the pyramid aren't just to look cool. Like it's, it's, it's a response to the context of the planet that they're on and the climate and the conditions because of sandstorms and these dramatic storms it wouldn't make sense to have a building that just has vertical walls, would it? So the, the, the walls are extremely slanted so that, you know, the buildings have like an aerodynamic quality to them so that sand, that sandstorms pass over them. And as a byproduct of that function, all of a sudden you start to get really dramatic and amazing interiors. Like you get that those dramatic angles inside and it's so visually pleasing um, and it's more than just looking cool, which is something that I'm just obsessed with as well. Like it has to go beyond just looking cool. Like if you have a reason and a logic behind it, it gets you so excited. Um, another recency bias is, have you seen Severance, the series on Apple? Oh, yes. So good. Oh, like that is, I just finished that the other day. That is absolute brilliance. Again, like the production design in that is second to none. Like for the listeners at home, if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert anyway, but um, like the main characters, there's four of them. They're in a mundane office. There's like four desks in a pinwheel arrangement. And for some reason, the space is extremely vast. Like it's such a big space, but there's no furniture. There's no objects. They just have their desks and their computers. There's nothing else in there. It's so bare. And like, that's again, the the power of good design and storytelling is you start to realize that these people working in this office are meant to be isolated. They're not allowed to leave this office. They're, it's meant to feel very clinical and sterile. And that's why there's no, there's no objects in there and they're meant to feel like that they are trapped and there's nowhere else they can go. Little things like that. Um, 
the hallways in severance like again the characters are not allowed to leave leave this office space so what does the production designer do with the hallways they're white narrow hallways that make you feel like you're tight claustrophobic they feel endless they keep turning at right angles the doors all look the same the color is all the same it's just white pure space and that creates this like sterile like frightening feeling of like you can't get out of this space and again we're visual creatures and like seeing that if you if you muted the film you would i'm sure you would get that feeling oh, yeah. um yeah. watching it that they're they're stuck in this place and they can't get out like that's again this goes back to what we we're saying doesn't matter how good you are at rendering or 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 how beautiful your images are like if the most important thing here is like design and like how can you put as much logic and you can into into your designs dude perfect examples um and we're speaking about jobs and dead end jobs like if i had to visually represent that that is kind of what it looks like yeah you know like being in space you can't escape until it shifts over um yeah. but yeah that show highly highly recommended if anyone is yeah absolutely to get on to that um, <laughs> ben stiller as well so yeah he smashed it is oh, excellent yeah and it also gives me the um when i watched them how you explained it is um the shining vibes you know like with the corridors yes. and how they're represented and obviously yeah like you can go along with anything kubrick's done and analyze it to death oh. because it's yeah. I, I believe he was into architecture also i know he's into photography and spaces yes. for example um yes. but even like um other filmmakers who are clearly obsessed with architecture and spaces like Denny Villeneuve just mentioned in almost yes. all of his films, the arrival inside the ship and even inside yep. the apartments, so good, especially for a narrative cause. Um, someone is just slipping my mind right now. Um, oh. Alex Garland in Ex Machina yes. and, you know, all, oh, all of his, gee, all of his stuff. That, so, that, uh, that's another. Yeah. Yeah, it's shame on you if you haven't anybody that hasn't watched that yet, because <laughs> that's another example of brilliant production design. And sorry, just as you mentioned, Stanley Kubrick as well. I forgot to mention, like two thousand and one was probably oh God, yes. like seeing that back in you. That is like my all time inspiration. That film and talking about amazing designs. Like I've always been obsessed, as probably everybody is anyway. But the <laughs> monolith, but not again. Like we're talking about like function and purpose and and. Yeah, good design principles. Like that's another example of it. Like that monolith. Like I remember again behind the scenes reading about it. They originally thought about having a TV screen on it because it was this 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 foreign tool that could teach people things. Mm. But what an amazing move to just remove that idea of a TV screen and just have a blank object. Because that design move made it no matter what context that it was in, it didn't fit in, and that was the intent. It's foreign to every space that it's in, whether it's in the desert. Or whether it's in whether it's in Dave's classical room, like every environment it's in, it it contrasts, and that it's such a simple design, but it's just so powerful. And that's another example of like logic and and critical thought and how powerful it can be, oh, and what can separate yeah. and what can separate you from from everybody else in, that, that's, in, in the industry. That is like again in terms of like coming up with a solution. That is genius. And look how long ago and look how old that film is. Um, yet that still hasn't been, I think, I would say surpassed. It's been emulated many times. It's been, yep. um, you know, like people have paid homage to that many, many times, but that is an excellent example of like, I guess, even just like shot design, visual design, graphic design. I, I know like he was big into photography as a keen photographer. So clearly he knew all about all that kind of stuff. Even his, um, I haven't seen all of his films, but I remember like Eyes Wide Shut being, Especially some of those, like you know, that that weird um, secret society type building. Um, yes, that was very like creepy, and you know, except obviously a lighting plays a big part in all that kind of stuff as well. But yeah, just to go back on the monolith, it's such a powerful, it's just a powerful like thought provoking image in terms of like the context yeah. of what it does for the story, in terms of what it what it means. It's it's yeah, it's sick. Um, yeah, look how well, look yeah. how it sticks to us to this day. Like it's how many years old? Like yeah, totally plus totally. years old. Like it's crazy. And again, if the brief was like, okay, we're going to put a TV there, which yeah, kind of makes sense in terms of like you know if you 
fast forward to today, like all we have is these monoliths in front of us. But obviously we see things yep. in them that make us want to throw bones in the air, for example. And yeah. obviously you know, in this case, it's <laughs> styluses and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, I get it as a metaphor, but that is way more mythological, way more thought provoking. Not kind of like, yes. hey, this is what we're trying to say about you and your future. It's almost a case of, what do you think this means? And that gets your mind racing and it's yeah. so powerful. Um, even yeah. the kind of, yeah, so that's a good one. Obviously, like things like Interstellar with, yes. that's, that's clearly like an homage to Kubrick and 2001, but I keep forgetting the names of the robots, but having those like cuboid Rubik's Cube type things that do all these cool things, is just looks great on screen versus intricate, multiple jointed, you know, like robots and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah, great, um, great, ref- great references. Ha- have you seen Utopia, the TV show, the British one? No, I haven't, unfortunately. Highly, highly recommended. But there's a scene, well, there's, there's a set in there where it's set in this office, like a very old English mansion office. And there's this really, like, very in-your-face, visceral wooden carving. I think it's called, like, it's panelling or cladding or whatever on the wall. Um that in terms of like as a space and environment i always found very ominous it always creeped me out like watching that which makes sense for the story um but yeah that's something that i would i'm yeah i'm gonna have yeah. to check it out yeah um awesome it's available somewhere um don't watch the remake which i think is on netflix or something or amazon it ended up on um i don't think that did too well it's kind of like old boy if you've ever seen that film like the korean version is the real yep. real version not the remake um that's an abomination yes. but yeah yeah uh, that's I'll, what it is i have to check it out um oh and like while we're talking about good good design and references another one that just came to my mind as well was um parasite have you seen parasite yes yes like that is like that's again another one that for anybody listening like in terms of good design and good storytelling like how if you're interested in architecture as well and designing spaces for film or games or whatever it is that is like absolute brilliance that so the main the main characters their living conditions compared to their the people that they are serving like if you start to unpack and analyze how different they live and the spatial qualities of where they live it, it's amazing when you when you draw the comparisons like so the main characters they live basically underground and the window that they have is like just a couple of feet above the surface mm-hmm. of, of the pedestrian walk. And just that as a visual metaphor, if you really think about it to show that these people are poor, they're, they're almost like it's portrayed as like, they're the scum, they're the scum of the earth. Oh, literal like poverty they line. They're just, you know, yeah. the heads above it yeah. kind of thing yeah. at people's feet. You're below yeah. people's feet. Yeah. Like that's an example of how architecture in film can be really powerful and like, and again, why design is so important and that in comparison to then the servant's house, which just to get to the front door, you have to walk, you have to ascend just to get to the front door. And just those shifts in levels in those design gestures is again, an example of, of brilliant filmmaking and brilliant design thought process. Nick, we need to wrap this up, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I could geek out about this stuff. Same. Not only, only all day for the rest of my life. Like this is really rewarding and really insightful things. Um, we definitely got to do another one, and from there we'll talk Absolutely. about, I guess, more real world inspirations, at least in terms of visual spaces. Um, but any kind of like, I guess, thoughts, anecdotes, or final words from yourself before we wrap up? Yeah, I think if there's something I can give back, like it would be to anybody, like at the start of their concept art or uh, concept design journey um, is if you're struggling, I guess, too, like with your path and thinking how you're going to make it into the industry or how you're going to get more work, which is like some questions and emails that I get. Like my advice is to just, what I learned is just go back to being, being you in the sense of go back to the films and the games that you love, that you like rather than social media and looking at, I guess every other artist's work and letting that conflict your thoughts. Go back to like certain scenes in a film or a game that made you feel a certain way and ask yourself, is that like, a, is that something that I want to design in the future? Is that something that I want to be a part of? And I think if you can build a portfolio based on 
analyzing those things and what you truly love, like no matter what, you will end up on those projects because that's exactly what I found. It wasn't until I went back to my architecture roots and I made my portfolio specifically architectural concept related that the work started coming in. Like I have very rarely had to go and not tooting my own horn, but like very rarely had to go out to anybody to ask for work. All the work has come to me because I've stuck to what I've loved to produce in the last three years and people keep coming to me specifically for whether it's brutalist or retro futurist architectural sci-fi spaces and that's the stuff that i want to work on and that i wanted to continue to work on in the near future and if you can build yeah form a portfolio that captures who you are and what you love you'll get plenty of work so i hope that advice can help somebody perfect advice nick it's amazing chatting with you today um very good chat thanks Thanks, Aaron. Again, like honor to be here. Listen to this for so long. So thanks for having me on. A massive thanks to Nick for that great conversation and in helping me realign my perspectives, which I'm sure has been the case for you too. Hit the links attached to this episode to give Nick a follow and then head over to LearnSquared.com to enhance your artistic career, just like Nick did by taking some LearnSquared courses. I've been your host, Aaron Danda. Till next time.